Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. As many of you guys already know, we are building a farm here in Siberia and we want to share with you the five best ways to save money buying a farm. Okay, for those of you who are new to the channel, or this may be the first time you've seen us, uh, as Josh mentioned, we are building a small farm here in Siberia. Uh, this is not the first farm that we built. We, uh, before we moved to Russia, we uh, had a fully operating farm in Australia, which we built from scratch, from just bare land. And what we wanna do is share with you the things that we look for uh, when we buy land. And we've also had many of you contact us selling what what do we look for? How would I do what you're doing? So they're the things that we're trying to share with you in this video. So we, we do videos like this and we're also filming the full story of us building this farm here. So if you're interested in that, um, be sure to subscribe to our channel yeah. and you can keep uh, up to date with what we're doing and see everything. Now, when it comes to buying land, the actual purchase price can end up only being a small part of what actually costs you to have your land. So you need to make sure that you're choosing very wisely and considering uh, the points that we're going to be talking about. So before you even buy your land, you need to have a plan of what you want to do mm. and be realistic about it. Yeah, I mean, if you're the difference between buying a land to run a thousand head of cattle or somebody who wants to have a small property where you can have a few chickens, ducks, a couple of sheep, maybe a milking cow, you're going to have different requirements. And they're going to make a big part of difference to which land you buy. So make a plan and then you'll be able to uh, accurately look for a, a block that, or some land that suits you. Point number one, uh, how do you get to your property? Do you have good access to your property? Yeah, access is a really important Thing to consider now you may have two wheel ruts that lead towards the land you want to buy but that doesn't mean that you'll be able to access your property all year round things to consider are what's it like when it starts to rain in the wet season that you have even where we are now we have excellent soil here but if you get a little bit of rain the top layer gets very slippery and it can make getting in and getting out if you don't have a four-wheel drive uh, much harder another thing to consider is like where we are we have winter in australia we never had snow but here we have snow we don't get a massive amount of snow but still you need to be able to access can i access it all year round will the snow be cleared can i clear the snow myself and think about how will i get to my property in the winter time or in the summer time so if your road isn't up to mm. standard and you need to fix your road uh, what does that look like? Uh, for example, we looked at a, another property in the mountains and it was about five kilometers from the main road to go in to our, into that property. And we would have had to um, re, basically redo the whole road. Um, it had a lot of rock under the soil, so that requires a lot of big machineries, mm. big machinery, bulldozers. Um, and also drainage so that the road stays good. Um, that is a very expensive mm. thing to do. Mm. That can easily be more than the land that you will buy in cost. Uh, to build a road is a very expensive process. So once you have uh, a, a good road, a good track into your property, what does it take to maintain it so that you can uh, access the whole year round? So I mentioned earlier that you know, for the snow, do you have equipment to be able to push the snow off the uh, the road so you can access it all year round? Uh, if you get a lot of water and, and you get ruts in your road, can you, do you have a machine that can fill in those ruts and, and, and get it back up to uh, a good condition again? And so when you, when you have to buy equipment uh, to keep your road well maintained, that's another very expensive part of having land. So you need to think about what will it take to keep my my access way, my road, uh, open and usable all year round? And also, 
how far are you from a publicly maintained road? Mm. Here we are quite close to it, but you might have five kilometers of snow that you mm. have to push off every time it snows, and that is another big cost. Mm. And yeah, being close to a publicly maintained road leads really well into our next topic. Number two, location. How far are you from the nearest town or community services? Things like schools, uh, hospitals, medical treatment, uh, even, even buying all the supplies you need to build and just daily supplies you need you know, for, for uh, shopping and things like that. Uh, being remote might seem really nice, really romantic, and it's okay, you can be remote, but you have to factor in the cost of what it's going to cost you to go to the local town and get supplies. And a lot of times it might be, you know, you're busy doing a project and, oh, I forgot, I need this. And then you've got to go and take this trip all the way to get it. And depending on how far you are, over a period of time of living on the land, that can really add up to, to a cost in not only time, but also in uh, the money that it takes to get there, driving backwards and forwards. And the other side of that is the other direction. Uh, if you need somebody to build your house or the structures on your property, um, what does it cost to get them to come in every single day? When you get things delivered, the longer delivery uh, fees that you will get if you live further away. And also things like, do you want an ambulance to be able to get to your property? If you live a long way away, um, you won't get that service. So is that something that you need? Mm. One more thing to consider is that if you do ever want to sell your property, you know, life circumstances change, you know, the more remote you are, it may make it a lot harder to sell. And that means you may not be able to get all the uh, capital or money that you've invested into your property back. So it's definitely something to consider. I'm not saying don't live remotely, but I'm saying do consider that it will cost a lot more to do the things you want to do than if you were closer to a town. Okay, number three, earthworks. So how steep is your land? How much fall is it in your land? Obviously, when you want to build, you need a nice flat area. And so if you have a lot of fall on your land, uh, it, it, earthworks become very expensive. Uh, and it's not just building your house, it's every other structure you want to build, whether it's a shed, a workshop, a chicken pen, a stall for your cows, all these things will need earth moved around and as anyone who's done earthworks will be able to tell you, they can be very expensive. Also, uh, what soil type do you have? If you live on a property that has rocks on it or really heavy clay, mm. um, it's gonna cost a lot to move that dirt around and level out a place where you can build a building. Mm. Um, whereas if you just have um, normal topsoil, it's uh, relative, well, a lot cheaper um, you can do it with a lot lighter equipment and uh, it will save you a lot of money. Mm. Another important thing to consider when you're buying land is groundwater. Uh, how close is the groundwater to the surface of the ground? Because uh, when you have a very high water level table, uh, building becomes a lot more expensive. Uh, you've got to try and deal with that water to get it away from the foundations you're placing in. So that's one thing to look with you're buying uh, if you're buying low land or land that's in a low-lying area in a valley, uh, look around and try and find out what's the water table like where you live. The higher you up are on a hill, obviously, the better it is, but you can still, uh, you can still have uh, water that's not too deep. Uh, so it's good to try and find out that before you buy the land, how deep is the water table in the area you want to buy. Also, what machinery do you have? Do you have any machinery at all? If you do, is it strong enough to do the job that you need done? Is it the right machinery for that? If you don't have machinery, um, can you get contractors in to do that work? Um, if you have rocks, do you have, are there contractors with a strong enough machine near where you live um, to do that job? Uh, or are they gonna have to come in from a long way away and cost you more? Yeah, machinery plays a very important big part in the overall cost because it's very expensive to rent machines uh, and to bring contractors in with a big enough machine to like Joe said break ground or break rock the other thing is to cart do you need 
soil carted in or gravel carted in for your construction. Uh, that's something that adds up as well very quickly. So there are definitely points to consider when, it, when in regards to earthworks and the cost involved. As you mentioned from the start, earthworks can be a very big expense. Number four, power. Uh, do you have power on your block? How far is it away? Um, getting power brought to you is a big cost. It doesn't matter which country you're in. In Australia, it's a big cost. In Russia, it is a big cost also. Um, also, uh, what type of power do you need? Um, are you planning to run a big workshop where you're going to need three-phase power? Do you, uh, because in Russia, in a lot of small villages, a lot of the power is quite low. If you're at the end of a power line, even running a welder, um, you have trouble. So that's a big consideration. Um, how far away is your power and the type of power you need? And it's not just Russia. Any, any uh, rural area, whether it be Australia, or America, or Canada, if you're at the end of the line, there's going to be a lot less power available uh, for you to run bigger machines. So it's something to consider. You might be a nice block, but if you're right at the end, you're going to struggle running workshop equipment. The other option that you have if there is no power already existing on your block or nearby is obviously off-grid. You can go with a solar power system, wind power system. Uh, Water power. Mm -hmm. Hydro, electricity. Yeah, if you've got, if you've got a river on your property, you, that's another wonderful option. Uh, but this is still uh, quite a big expense to set up a, a stable uh, power system that will run your house. I'm not just talking about you know two lights for the evening time. I'm talking about to be run all the things that you need in your house. Washing machines, ovens, uh, fridges, freezers, fridges, freezers all, the, all those appliances. That's not even equipment that you would use in the shed with air compressors and, and welders. Uh, and if you want a off-grid power system that can run those sorts of things, that's still an expensive option. It may be a better option, it may be cheaper than getting power connected, but it's something that you need to consider uh, when looking for land. And that's why it's, it's a, a cost consideration. And if you, like for us, we have power running through our property, and that was one of the reasons that we lent towards buying this property was because power to get power connected was much much cheaper because it was close by and this is also a high voltage line which means we can run any sort of equipment we like off this power line point number five water water is essential to life uh, what water sources are on your land do you have any water sources like a, a river or a creek that'd be wonderful uh, a well a bore is that on is that on your land already uh is there or if you don't have any of those things uh can you do you know how deep the water is below your ground can you put a bore down can you put a well down these things all add up to you know how much it costs to to actually get water so that you can sustain life not just for you but for your animals and for all the daily things that we use water for and also the quality of your water if you're pulling it out from the ground, does it have a lot of heavy metals in it that you need to filter out? Because putting a filtration system in there costs money and replacing your filters, mm. and um, it's quite a process to filter heavy metals out of water. Also, it's dirt and sand. You know, if you're running from a shallow well, there could be a lot of mud and clay in your well. So that's all going to not only need a filtration system, but you'll need to be maintaining it and cleaning those filters regularly. The other thing to think about is storing your water. Now, if, you're, if your groundwater is only, only just below ground surface and you can pump out of that, you may be able to pump directly from the ground sort of into your house or where you need it. But if you're either pulling from a river or a creek or a, a deep bore, uh, you're going to need to pull the water out of the ground and then store it in a tank. And then from that tank, then obviously have a pump so that every time you turn on the tap, you get water coming out. So there's another cost to not only getting the water or having the water, but being able to use the water on a regular basis with a, with a tank and uh, some kind of pressure pump so that every time you, know, you need water, it's available to use. If you don't have any of those options, there are a few other options. Hmm. For instance, in Australia, uh, on farms, we always built 
big tanks that we would collect water off our roofs and store them yeah. in the tanks, which is another cost. But in Russia, it's even a bigger cost because when you have the winter that freezes, um, you have to insulate that mass of water so that it doesn't freeze and destroy all your plumbing. Another option for water, maybe for livestock, is building big ponds in your valleys. I'm mm. um, getting earthworks done. If you don't have a river, you can collect the water, but then just like a house bed, you need to get big machinery in to build the wall so that you can have a pond that your stock can drink out of. All right, guys, we thought we'd throw a bonus one in for you. Uh, this one can be quite often overlooked and uh, undervalued and also it can make a big difference to the value of life you have on your farm. And this is orientation. How is your land orientated? Now, if your land is flat, orientation depends more on what's in front if you have a lot of trees or not. And we're talking about how much sun access you get on your land. Uh, so for us here in the Northern Hemisphere now, uh, we were looking for a south facing block, something that faced towards the south. So we're getting maximum sun uh, on our land because sun equals uh, obviously warmth in winter. It equals longer growing seasons and uh, just generally uh, it's more pleasant. If you are in the, uh, the shade, if you're shade, you don't have a lot of sun, it can be not as nice to live on that land. When we had our farm in Australia, obviously we're at the other hemisphere, we were looking for land that had a northern aspect. So the, it's, it's just something to consider. For example, we looked at another property mm. um, a little bit further into the mountains. A really beautiful spot um, nestled in the mountains, but it had one problem. It was right in the bottom of a valley. And even though the valley went uh, faced toward the south, so you did get sun coming through. Mm. Because you had the mountains on either side, in winter, when the sun came up and was low, you would only get about three hours of sunlight max at winter. So uh, that means you'll be spending more time, uh, more money on lighting, more money on heating because you're not getting that sun value. And even when your snow melts, um, it's just gonna take a lot longer. Mm. So it's not just with your when you build a house to consider the what direction you face the house. So you're getting maximum amount of sunlight coming into your home uh, during the winter period, so that you can get a the warmth of the sun. But also, uh, particularly in a in a winter climate like where we are, uh, it's just really pleasant in uh, to have the sun coming into your house during the winter period. That was another reason why we chose the area. Uh, where we live is because we do get a lot of winter sun. Uh, it's not overcast here during winter. Uh, so it's it's important for your house, but also for things you want to grow. Uh, when your crops, when you have a longer uh, sun orientation period in the south, you can plant your early crops earlier and you'll get a, a later harvest. So all these things add up to make uh, your property just that much nicer uh, to live on. Well guys, that's our five plus one, our best ways to save money in buying a farm. We hope you guys really enjoyed the content. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe. Um, we hope that you learnt a lot in this video. Uh, if you did like it, leave it a big thumbs up and let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. Uh, subscribe if you're new again and share it with other people. Um, get the information out to people. Uh, we hope you guys are all having a great day and we'll catch you on the next one. See you guys. Bye.